Awesome. Hey guys, today is a very, very special impromptu episode of Keeping It Real with Real People. I am your host, Abby Pagood, with The Capital Life, where we talk about all the things, the good, the bad, and the healthy. And today, I have two very, very special goats guests that with me today that we are talking to talk about a very impactful story that I think all of you will just be mind blown about. But before we introduce these two amazing people, um, I wanted to make sure that you guys like and share this because not only is it going to be impactful to you, but it also might be very impactful to a loved one that might be experiencing some of the same things or is about to experience some of the same things. Um, another thing, shout out we have to do is that our capital partner of the month is Be Zen Holistic Wellness Center in Allen. Um, Audra Watley in particular, if you've seen previous podcasts that I have done, she has been in the podcast. She's super amazing um, facility. They handle food allergies. They handle acupuncture. They handle supplements. They handle the works. So if you have not looked for them, you should seek them out because they are incredible. So we are going to get into it and dive into these two awesome people. So this is Trish Littlejohn and Mark Littlejohn, and they are just the most amazing couple. They're so much fun to be around, and Trish is a very good friend of mine. I think we've known each other for... Uh, eight years. Yeah, like with long, 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 oh. long time. So we have totally been just like, just on, honestly, instant marketing friends and then instant friends. So she is freaking fabulous. And what's really important for you guys to know about her is that they have just been celebrating their 17th anniversary. Yep. Like, not even a day or two ago, correct? Saturday. 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 So Saturday. They are celebrating their 17th wedding anniversary, which to which they, of course, celebrated correctly and went out of town and enjoyed their time. However, 10 years ago, it was seven years ago, seven years, seven, seven years ago, it was their wedding anniversary was not what they anticipated it to be. And I will hand that off to you, Trish, because what happened seven years ago? Because what are we celebrating first and foremost today? Well. Our, our anniversary, wedding anniversary. But then we, uh, I had open heart surgery. So we had a different kind of uh, plan. So we knew in October um, of the, the year before, in 2014, that I had an aneurysm um, in my heart, on the top of my heart, or however you say it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there'll be some corrections somewhere on this one. <laughs> no corrections anyway. needed here. On the um, Capital Life, we just deal with all the things when they come. So they... Um, they found it from a bug bite. I had an anaphylactic shock, some weird scenario outside. And um, they found it and said, you have an aneurysm on your heart. And the good news is uh, we found it. The bad news is you got to see a cardiologist. So we did that within six months. Um, it, had, it was already pretty big. Um, so the more I exercise, ironically, I've always had it. It was a genetic thing. My father has... Um, my mom and dad both had blood issues, and then my dad has the aneurysm side. And they didn't family. catch it until you had a bug bite, which until caused bug, anaphylactic shock, I got which caused you to go to the hospital. Clot. I had a blood clot go to my lung from the anaphylactic okay. shock, so that's how they caught it. So they got it under control, but then that's when the CT scan showed up. And they said, did you know this? I said, no, I did not. But when we saw the cardiologist, he said, did you know that you only you have a bicuspid, not a tricuspid? Okay. I'm like, uh, and what is the difference for people? Do you know what the difference is? Well, with the well so I had in your arteries going that. into the heart, mm -hmm. you have three valves. Right. So it's, you know, it's kind of like an alien movie, right? You get this little cylindrical device and you have three flaps. Trish only had two. Okay. So ideally the heart works with three flaps so that the muscle works correctly. So the biological defect that she didn't have the third flap, yeah, she only it, had the two. It was essentially a birth defect. Okay. And so what would happen is the flaps wouldn't pump blood efficiently enough so that her blood would circulate through her body correctly mm -hmm. to have enough oxygen. So while she was an athlete all her life and into college and playing college sports and stuff, she always struggled with, you know, uh, fatigue, exhaustion, mm -hmm. right. and she's, breathing. She's not so, getting enough oxygen, right. which and, that's uh, probably why exercise made it worse. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was really funny when we started talking to the doctor, funny and not funny, because when they first told us, they said, hey, we have good news and bad news. And at first, they kind of attacked us. 
They're like, why didn't you tell us you had a birth defect? And you're like, what how would defect? I? Yeah, no. how, we, we, we had no idea. I'm not we scanning out, myself every morning before I go to work to just double yeah, check. We're sitting outside and she's like, oh, something bit me. And I mean, not five <laughs> minutes later, she's just, her, her leg starts out with this rash and she's like, I'm going to go take a cold shower. And by the time she comes in, takes that cold shower and comes out, her whole body just is in hives. Wow. So we, you know, we rushed to the emergency room and what happened, the reason for the scan is when they tried to give her the IV, they couldn't uh, get the needle correctly in her arm okay. for an IV. Okay. So they actually caused the blood clot that we wound up going back the next day for okay. and finding all of this out because all they were treating was the bug bite and the anaphylactic shock. Oh no. So then she started struggling with breathing and chest pains and shoulder and arm pain the following day. So we go back and they go, okay, uh, you do have a blood clot. We're going to give you these meds to break it up and so forth. And that's when we found out was the following day. Okay. Because when they told us that she had the birth defect and then they said, okay, so your uh, aortic artery on the top, you know, it's about as big as your little finger. Mm -hmm. So they showed us and they go, okay, you have an aneurysm, but it's okay right now. And when they showed it to us, this looked like it was stuffed with three golf balls. Yeah. It was, and they're like, it's only what, five centimeters? No, and you, it had to be five, and I was at 4.8 or something. Yeah, like and they were how like. Did, how did you react, like, seeing this on screen with right. the doctors? And, like, do you, could you even emotionally well, process any of this? I, no, I guess we just put it off, kind of. We like, did. We just, they I told know, us she was my okay. Dad had one, and then I go, okay, whatever. Okay. And but, you're just like, I've got a life to live. Let's just Yeah, I'm like, all right, fine. But so, until it affected me, it so, when, that's when I needed the surgery. I need that. How long did it take? Before you need, you need, you waited October to, six to May. October to May. Yeah, okay. And, May was, and how did you know that it was time for the surgery? Um, because I would, I would walk maybe at, I don't know, 20 feet and I, my blood pressure would skyrocket. I'd see stars and I just wouldn't have any oxygen and wow. I would just take it out of me. And so at that time I had to wait for the cardiologist to introduce me to the surgeon that was going to do the surgery and they needed to wait till it was big enough to do that. And so. At that point, then we finally met him. We met him on a Monday, and our anniversary was on a Thursday. And he's like, I would get you in right now. It's, you know, that crucial, but we'll have to wait and do it on the, you know, on the 7th. I'm like, well, that'll be a great day. It's our anniversary. So our 10-year wedding anniversary is a little different. But we did, and it, we thought it would be fine. I was in healthy. I was healthy. I wasn't, you know, he's like, we'll get the aneurysm, and we're going to give you a mechanical valve. So. Mark was disappointed. He thought I'd get a pig valve since he's from Arkansas. But, you know, I'm like, whatever. Just make it so I can live again. And no big deal. So, unfortunately, after about less than 24 hours later, I, I started to fail. My heart, I had a blood clot, and they didn't know what it was. So all my organs and stuff started to shut down. So they had to take me into emergency surgery. And they told Mark to call the family because it probably, they weren't sure at the time. And that more than likely I wouldn't make it. Um, so we took, I woke up from the surgery originally great and doing well, but then as time went on, I couldn't get off the medication or something, I guess. And I didn't know yeah. for, I didn't wake up for two weeks in my, I, I didn't, I don't remember all this stuff. That, you just, that stuff. did you just almost feel like you were asleep and gone? Kind like, of. I could see everyone. I was in some little bubble thing. Okay. Um, it, was like a, it was like a little uh, inner tube, like a, I don't know, like a clear bubble. Like you ever see that little, that show when yeah. we were kids, that kid is in the bubble. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what it was like. Thing. So I could see everyone out there talking and doing stuff. And I kept thinking, well, how's come they're not letting me out? Right. So I don't really know what you don't, your body doesn't let you know exactly what's going on. So um, like you're distorted because you're inside this bubble. Yeah. And I'm you're like, like, hey guys, but you're like, wait, and they're all talking I can't. and doing stuff. And then. I'm hearing things. I'm like, well, how come you're not letting me out? Yeah, it sounds like this, I mean, like, it sounds like you were totally on like the spiritual plane where yeah. you could be in an observational space, but at the same time, yeah. like you're not in the physical, like you're not in the physical world. Because I mean, no. really, a lot of people don't realize that our bodies end up. A lot of times, when we go to sleep at night, our spirit will travel and it will visit people and check on loved ones yeah. and do all kinds of things. Because energy doesn't die; it shifts, right? Yeah. So it's kind of crazy that you had that experience and how long were you you said two weeks it for me it was like two weeks before I ever came back but 
um, I guess I was what a, a week or so, and I started taking the vents and some other stuff. I started to come back around, I think. Two weeks. But um, I remember talking to my stepdaughter, Corey, for a second and just said, don't forget me. I remember that. Um, she showed me some pictures or something, and then I flatlined. Well, in my head, I uh, went like I was in a dream again, and I was talking to this couple, which actually was the nurse that saved my life. Um, because they were saying her name so much, she and um, mm -hmm. I felt the paddle, so they paddled me yeah. to you know to get me back, and I felt that, but I thought it was something different, and uh, so when I did come up the second time around and I woke up, then I said to him, I know why this happened because and I couldn't talk very well because it had strained my vocal cords, mm -hmm. so it was a few months almost before I could speak, but um, I said I know why because. She hit me in the chest, or I said her husband hit me in the chest, because that's what it felt like. So yeah. I remember feeling it and thinking, "Gosh, that really hurt." Um, but your mind and your body just does something different. But then, uh, when I before they co before they shocked me or whatever, I could see myself in this canoe taking this long route to the hospital. I'm thinking, "Man, I'm never gonna make it," <laughs> you know. And so I don't know. I remember this stuff so real vivid. So um, I had a little PTSD after things got better when I got home yeah. finally, but. I was almost three months there, so and then I had to go to rehab and stay at a facility afterwards. So I don't know. It was a very long process. I, I you know, I couldn't walk. I couldn't feed myself. I couldn't. A lot of things were not right. And there's a lot of people that um, were very supportive, friends-wise, that came to see us and helped Mark out or fed him because he couldn't eat. us on a feeding tube and stuff. But um, but we were very blessed. We had a lot of great friends, and some of those friends are, you know. They were in our life at that time. I can't say we see them as much now, but I'm always very grateful for them yeah. and all they did for us um, and, and for Mark because I was not around a lot. My aunt was here um, from Iowa, so that was helpful. Um, but uh, but I've had some hiccups here and there since it's happened, but otherwise I'm really healthy, I think. So. Well, and my, my really big question is, is a lot of times when we're all going through like this massive trauma experience, right? Like mm -hmm. it's not just, okay, her body shutting down. So her body like completely, it's almost like she regresses back into her soul and her spirit and as origin of life, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're busy self-healing on the undercover where no one can really see. And then on the outside, you're witnessing all the physical aspects that's happening to her. And then it, like, I'm sure that even just thinking about it today really brings you back to the, like the hours of waiting and not knowing what, was it that was most impactful for you that in witnessing what she was going through and not having a clue of where, where it was going to go? Well, uh, you saw me looking for something earlier and Trish pretty much covered the story and, uh, you know, from really beginning to end, you know, she was in the hospital over two months and, been in rehab for a couple of weeks and came home, like she said, couldn't feed herself, couldn't get around. It was a real struggle. So the biggest thing was uh, having, continuing to have hope, faith, and patience. Hmm. When, we, when we were going through it all, we, we, we went into it um, haphazardly and happy-go-lucky. Because that's, that's how we live our life. That's I how mean, you guys it's just, are. It's, it's just, we, we like to have fun. We tease each other. We have a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And uh, most people that meet us and know us, you know, just say, God, I wish I could have just half of what you guys have. But it's because we believe in one another. We're honest with one another. And we trust one another. Yeah. But we also laugh at a lot of the little things. We don't sweat the small stuff. Though Trish does sometimes because she's OCD. So if you move something right she's now, she'll move it back. She, yeah, she's a worry That's for but, sure. So, you know, going with that, she had the doctor. You know, he was very serious. He was a great doctor and everything. But she was cutting, cracking jokes. I was cracking jokes. You know, I was like, okay, so, you know, no pig valve, huh? It's got to be. That's why they waited four days because he had to order the valve. Because he was like, I need to get you in now. He goes, but if I do this now with a cow or a pig right. valve, it, it'll take, but we're going to do this again in a year right. because we've got to fix this. And uh, so we're like, okay, everything goes in, everything's fine. Um, she goes into surgery. And like she said, she comes out of surgery and it's, it's like nothing ever happened. 
she's walking, she's talking, she's typical Trish. She's got everybody in stitches and everybody just can't believe like you just came out of a six and a half, seven hour heart surgery. How are you so, you know, energetic? And then after about two or three hours, she goes, you know, I'm really tired. I'm going to, I'm going to sit down, but she's walking. I mean, they're just, it, she's blowing their mind. And like Trish said, you know, she started failing and they called everyone in. They said, we're rushing her back into surgery. Um, and what they thought was her organs were shutting down as a rejection to the valve. They didn't realize because they found other things because of her um, uh, genetics mm -hmm. um, that the sutures didn't take correctly on your artificial valve okay. and the, the, the new artery por por portion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they grafted that, it was leaking. So what had happened, a clot had formed around her heart and stopped her heart before they got her into surgery. And they told us that, you know, call the family, get everybody here. So our aunt was there, Trisha's aunt and my daughter and other people and friends and stuff waiting out in the lobby. And um, So I went down to the chapel. Mm. because it was testing my faith. I couldn't believe that we'd had so many events before that happened on our anniversary each year that has significance. And for us, numbers is, are very important. Our birthdays, our wedding anniversary. So the number seven was very important. And with this being our 10th wedding anniversary and her being a surgery and then going in within 24 hours and failing and then telling us together, the family that, you know, just be prepared. We, don't, we, we have no idea what we're going to find and we don't think we can fix this. So they rush her back into surgery. I go to the chapel by myself. I wanted to be alone. And when you walk into the chapel in Baylor heart hospital, they have a bowl and this bowl has these little, pieces of paper, green pieces of paper. And I, I take this one. And it's a Bible verse. Isaiah 41, 13. Give me a minute. Uh, take your time. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand. I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, for I will help you. So I held on to this and prayed and just sit in solitude for the next three and a half hours. Trisha's brother comes down about three and a half hours later because they knew where I was at. They said they'd come and get me. And uh, he says, hey, uh, the surgery's complete. They're waiting on Trisha's recovery. Looks like everything went okay. But they said she's going to be touch and go. And they put her in the medically induced coma. And they're not sure when they'll bring her out because of, uh, we didn't know all the factors at that time. He says, so why don't we take you to the cafeteria and get you something to eat? And um, I'm like, okay, I really wasn't hungry, but I'm like, okay, I'll appease everybody and I'll go to the cafeteria with everybody. So when I walk out of the chapel, I still have this piece of paper that I took because I felt like, you know, you get one and, and it's important, it's critical. So when you come out of the chapel in the hospital, the front doors are there, big double doors and big revolving door. And I walk out and I see another piece of green paper in the doorway. I didn't pay any mind to it. I saw it. I thought that's really uh, peculiar that someone else had a piece of paper. I didn't notice it going in, but the same little green piece of paper that I knew was out of that bowl was sitting in right there in the window uh, in the entryway. I didn't think, I didn't think twice about it. We go in probably 20, 25 minutes later after we have breakfast and stuff, then we, we're going back to the room or the waiting area to 
wait on the doctors because the nurse came down and said the doctor will be out in about 10 or 15 minutes if you guys want to come up. So when we walked out, everybody's going to the elevator and coming to the elevator, the chapel's right here and the doors are over here. I walked by the chapel to the elevator and I just happened to glance over at the door again. And granted, it's been 20 or 25 minutes and that green piece of paper was still in the doorway. Because I still had this piece, I thought, why would someone leave that there? Why didn't someone pick it up and throw it away? So I picked it up. You want me to read it for you? You got it? Yeah, I got it. So when I opened it up, this piece of paper was a saying from Robert Fleming, I believe. It says R. Fleming. It's not a Bible verse. But I opened it up and it said, one of God's greatest blessings is to realize that he can be trusted. I carry these two pieces of paper with me everywhere I go. Because when you go through what we went through, and like Trish said, she they told us she wasn't probably going to make it when they took her back into surgery. And then she coded two more times during the, her whole stay. And sitting there by her side and holding her hand and watching that monitor flatline and life leave her body was devastating. But I had these and I continued to believe and pray. And when I sat there holding her hand, watching her life leave her body, I was just like, you can't give me this and do this to me right now. So seven years later, we still laugh and we have fun and we're just so thankful. He upped his own life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, on me, because I couldn't up it on you. <laughs> you have a pre existing condition. <laughs> All right. Can't listen, so, you have everything. <laughs> but you can see that, I mean, while this was very hard, it was it's one of those things where I, I, I apologize to Trish quite often she's like why do you do that and because i experienced her dying i sat there and held her hand when life left her body and they got her back and it was brutal and excruciating so i tell her all the time i'm sorry if i go before you again i i don't want it to happen to her i, I mean we all know that life is inevitable that it's going to end but how you live it and how you prepare for the end and continue to live is going to be the lesson or the example that you give to others. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's just, you know, enjoy every day as, as it's given to us, make the most of it, enjoy our friends and family and, and trust and believe that God has a plan because Trish has touched so many lives since this event that, I, I think that God had a plan. He still has a plan because she's healthy. She's, she's fun to be around. She's a, a, a joy every day to be around. There are little bitty moments and, we're, but it seems, we're still human. well, it's, but that's why I said, we don't sweat the small stuff, right? You know, we're human, you yeah. know, we're not perfect. We, uh, we don't uh, get along every day, you know, Trish buys more things than we need sometimes. And, you know, I buy more things than we need sometimes. And we just put up with one another. But we both so much enjoy the, the time and the opportunity that we were offered from God to extend our lives and to share our lives with other people like we're doing here today. So thank you.
Well, I appreciate you sharing your story so much. And I, I had already heard a lot of this story from Trish herself, you know, when we became friends and hearing her story was such an impact, but I was really curious more to hear on the spousal perspective, because when we go through these massive traumas, especially when it's not expected and you can see such a significant difference on how she not only reacts to it because there's not much that she can do. She's completely surrendered control because she knows she's in God's hands and whatever is supposed to happen will happen. Mm -hmm. In the same point, when she, her physical body was in need of rest and forced into a coma, she immediately, she could still see, she could still hear her loved ones. She could still be around them where you're having to do with the loneliness of what it feels like to, have to handle those obstacles by yourself and watch her going through it. So when, when all of this, like when we have get her back and everything and they're like, Holy crap, it's a miracle. Like, Holy, like how is she in here? Obviously there's a rhyme reason for everything. Mm -hmm. What was recovery like? Because recovery is sometimes one of the most challenging and, like also strangely rewarding experience of your life because God kind of puts like a mute button on you, right? It's almost like he pauses you and you are forced to have to listen and learn and seek patience and all of that. So when you are going through all of your recovery and physical therapy and trying to get like your memory and verbal and all of that stuff back, what did you have to, where did you have to dig deep to, to stay with it because that can be so taxing emotionally well, for a little while I, I didn't for a little while I was just sucking air is how I called it okay. um, so they come in at about 3 in the morning and scan my lungs every day because I had so much fluid um, from whatever I don't know how that works but I had a lot of fluid like over 50 pounds of fluid on it seemed like and uh, so I was drowning every time they would do something so I kind of panicked if I laid the bed back or do anything but one night the lady came in, this was soon after I woke up and they were doing the, the x-ray and she said, are you okay? And I said, I'm just sucking air. And I looked over at Mark. I love that expression. And he's laying on the, he's laying on the uh, couch and you know, he's, they have a couch in the room, it's sort of big there. It's such a nice hospital. And uh, all I could think is I love him, but I'm ready to go because I was so uncomfortably, um, Exhausted when, if too. you've never ever like had to hold like just hold your breath as long as you can and then start thinking about somebody dipping you in the water and trying to suck air it, it was like i was drowning all the time it seemed like so it took a long time for them to finally drain the fluid off my lungs and in one lung i had a liter and a half of fluid. wow so um so people were like no wonder she like acted like that but it took a while. The body can process it a little bit, and that's what they were hoping for. But the, the fluid was so massive, I couldn't see my, my feet or my legs were swelled. I, was, I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out of bed. I needed four people to help me. I think the, the best thing was just to get a shower, and they have showers in those rooms. And So I think that was one of the first times I was like, oh, a hot shower. You just take so much for granted when you're healthy and doing your thing in your house and getting up in the morning and doing your hair and taking off and... I lost some of my hair for a while and I did get better. And I don't know, just stuff, you know, like at the end of the day, sometimes I have to dial my own self back because the people that do know me know I worry about stuff or get wound up about the stuff that I can't even control most of the time. But Which I'm kind of surprised that you having to have poor people help you. And this is yeah, a woman a that does not like to rely or inconvenience anybody <laughs> like ever. Yeah. Like the first thing she will do is be like, Oh no, that's too much. Oh, don't, don't do it. If it's convenient. Like even when I requested to do the podcast of their story, she immediately, we were going to schedule for Wednesday yeah. and then she texts, can you do it today? But don't feel like you have to <laughs> like, as if, like, like as if this was going to be like, Oh no, we're not going to do it. Cause I'm not in the mood. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah. You're nuts. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I have my moment. Life but it's is, impressive to like have to rely on so many people to take care of you and well, get you back on your feet. It was a lot. And it's, actually the physical therapist I had was little like you. 
So I would always go, I don't think you, are you sure? And remember, I still couldn't talk. So it was really soft. Like it was barely could hear me. And so I'd, Mark would have to tell him most of the time. I couldn't push the button for help, even if I could push it, because they still couldn't hear me through the thing. Right. But there were some funny things too. But yeah, they, uh, we had a good, I mean, I would, she's like, I have you. I've got you, Trish, I can do this. I'm like, I don't know, because I was so big, and I just could hardly move. And wow. So I don't know. God takes you sometimes to another place, and he says he's got you, and you have to have faith he does. There was times I just I just didn't know if I could handle it, if I could fight that much harder anymore. But um, but I fought, through it. I, fought, I fought through it, and it is what it is now, yeah. so I'm good. Well, I, my favorite thing is that you really relied on other people being able to surrender your efforts because you lost your basically your strength. Well, when you because can't you're... speak either, I think I think you forget about your voice and what it means. And mm-hmm. I couldn't speak, so they couldn't hear me. Um, and most people think this is funny. I was like, really? But the nurse, the speech pathologist, comes in, and they thought they're going to have to do something to go down my throat again and try to do something to get the vocal cords to start coming around. And uh, so I was like, no, 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 I don't want anything else, you know. And, uh, I'm, and so she comes in and she's like, okay, we're going to start trying to strengthen them up. And so I thought he put her up to it. And she said, <laughs> I want you to say, woo, pig, suey. <laughs> I go, what? Like, and he's laughing so hard. He's so excited. And she goes, no, really. This is like, it, it will strain. I want you to, you know. So I had to say woo, pig, suey a lot. And it was very hard because I'm breathing wise even hard. So, but, uh, but I had amazing people. I had amazing um, staff that took care of me, my doctors. I still have a lot of specialists that take care of me um, from all the issues I still have now, now and then, and just checkups and stuff. But I, I really am blessed. And the woo pig suey, we laugh at that too. But Do you ever come is home? Is that like your new, like, honey, I'm home? No, no, Do you come I mean, in and be no. like, woo, pig suey? Exactly. Yeah. Like, no, it's just me growing up in Arkansas and loving the Razorbacks. Yeah. So it's just, you know, their call sign for, for that. So, and it was the, the reason, too, we were laughing with the doctor when I said, oh, no pig valve? You know. Yeah. So, so the mechanical valve, though, so if anyone's ever close to me, like when we did get home, I was sitting in the chair and the, the grandson at the time was younger, but he was sitting next to me and he's like grabbing my hand and I didn't have anything on. He's like, where's your watch? I'm like, I don't have a watch on. He goes, what is that noise? I go, it's my heart. He goes, can you turn it down? It's so loud. <laughs> I said, you know, actually, no. And I'm hoping it stays like that. But it's something you don't realize. And so you can feel the heartbeat really strong. So sometimes it's a little much for me. And I wasn't ready for that either. But um, majority of the time, it's good. So. Yeah, because when we first got home and so forth, you know, um, we, did, we didn't run a fan. You know, we mm-hmm. just run the air conditioner or whatever. And so Trish couldn't sleep for the her heart ticking and being so loud. And it would I mean, can I'd you be imagine like, every it, day listening to your own heartbeat constantly? It's like kind of annoying. And t- sometimes <laughs> it's a lot stronger than others. Or sometimes it'll make me even move because yeah. it's it's so strong. Yeah, it's the rhythm of the heart, but it's like a you, you just hear it and it's like a grandfather clock. It's it's my show and tell item. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We'll hope it shows and tells for a long time. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Well, my last thing that I would like to ask you guys is, I mean, you already touched base a little bit on it, Mark, but if you if you guys had advice for anybody, and this could be in regards to, like, your physical health, your mental health, relationship advice, I mean, what is something that you would want to say to people to broaden awareness of the unexpected and... I think I think everyone should live for the day, not the year, not six months from now. I think you just have to live for the day. And I think you have to, we just went to a funeral not so long ago, and this guy read a poem, and I know it's out there about the dash between the day you're born and the day you die. So what is your dash in life, and how did you live it, and how will people talk about you? And I think that's... I think that's probably what I live for sometimes. I wonder what my dash will say that day. Um, but when I saw the light, literally, and it's taking me in a canoe and thinking, I'm gonna not, I'm not gonna make it. But oh well, it's just gonna be a slow. Like your body just does something different. Uh, but I still could hear everything. So when people are in comas or their family's in a coma, maybe don't assume they can't hear you. 
because they can hear you. Maybe it's not, it's just sorted. But there was so many things that I told them when I came around that they had no idea. They were like, how did she know that? Um, there was no way I would have right. known it, right? So just always have faith and appreciate your loved ones and appreciate your people that you're, you know, around family, friends, whatever. And just remember, other everybody has a story. Yeah. Our story is what it is, but everybody has a story. And I think at first your healing is you need to tell your story sometimes. Um, maybe Mark should tell it more often so he gets better, right? But well, so it very, doesn't make him so sad. But it's very um, emotional. It is. Emotional. And it, well, and it's the memory. I mean, it's just it really yeah. it's taking you through it. And you know, like no offense, but you you were in like. Yeah. spiritual floating space yeah. you were in your bubble yeah so like your yeah. body's doing your thing and then this poor man's having to witness and deal which well, really in COVID like right. I say to him I'm so glad if that's how to go through this journey I'm glad it wasn't during COVID because I don't think I would have made it because I really couldn't help myself yeah and there's no way a nurse can help you 24 7 no. they just can't even though they're they're with you. They can't. They yeah. can't do everything. And I couldn't even talk on the thing to tell them to come get me or, or help me or anything. Right. And uh, so Mark had to feed me and all kinds of stuff. It was kind of, it was bad. So I feel bad for the people who had to watch their loved ones maybe get suffering during COVID because that breathing is, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's, yeah. You don't, you take for granted. Absolutely. Well, and I would imagine also like, I, I, I'm just saying from perspective of witnessing what you guys like have gone through. I would imagine that on your perspective, it would be hard to like almost cut the umbilical cord, so to speak. Like, you know, I would, I would imagine that I would almost be a little helicoptery just after the oh, fact. Oh, was very much so. And and like, well, right, but at the same even when time, I got home, I still wasn't strong enough to be right. really by myself, even though I I thought I was. Right. But I had different people. He had it all scheduled for people to come at certain times. And, and you they had to just off. trust his schedule because you I had to give him. And, you yeah. needed to rest, but also you needed to also respect his process for healing. Yeah. Because that was something he could control. We did actually go to therapy. Uh, we did go to um, to a counselor. Okay. Um, for a little PTSD that I was having afterwards, and Mark got to go too. So he, we both had our own time with her a little bit, and I think that did help us. We were very mm -hmm. fortunate for, you know, to have that opportunity. So um, it helped us heal, I think, a little bit. And we, you know, and she was really good with us. And then she said, "I think, I think you're there now. I think you." Okay. And I think, I think it was good because. Everybody has a story. Some people have, have had heart surgery, maybe not open heart, but they've had heart surgery and whatever. But at first you're like, okay, you have no idea what I went through. Yours is not even the same. Right. But at the same time, in their eyes, it is the same. It was right. tragic for them. So right, because they all have different them. thresholds. Yeah. Right. And we, and yeah. we, and I, and I let one of our... So I'm much better about that probably now than I was yeah. then at the time. But it's, you know, life is very short and very fragile. So we all need to just live and enjoy and be good to one another and just know that people all have a story no matter what their story yeah. is give them give them the two minute head like just listen sometimes because sometimes that's all people want is just to tell you their story and it yeah. will impact your life well you know they always say what's your elevator pitch mm -hmm. if you if you have this to say and you have this time between the elevator and you said it you know she said hear their story and everybody has a different opinion right, right. and it affects them differently so Tragedy affects us all differently, but I think the one thing I get out of this is this, that my continued faith in God and believing that God has power over all of this and trusting and believing in that's very important. Yeah. I think sometimes the struggle is, is people don't understand why God does the things he does that people feel like if, if God's such a loving God, how can he do this? Right. Well, he does it because that's how he tests your faith because God can be a giving God, but he can also be a vengeful God. So right. think of, you know, it's the old saying, what goes around comes around. Right. And, and you know, we're all going to face judgment one day. Mm -hmm. Some people don't believe, you know, I feel sorry for those people. Because at the end of the day, you don't do judge a book by its cover. Because right. everybody has a story. And if you don't give them that few minutes to give their elevator pitch to see if you believe or not, then, then you, you don't know. Like Trish said, give them, give them the opportunity, right. but then at the same time, tell your story because everybody's different. Yeah. So for me, uh, and Trish's heart surgery and we're here 
It's not like experiencing can cancer or something else that's eating away at somebody's body, muscular dystrophy, those kind of things where people spend years taking care of people who are going to continue to deteriorate. Right. That takes a special kind of faith and strength. Yeah. So it's very important. Well, and I and I kind of would like to add to that because I think it's not just, I think it's remembering to have compassion to be able to listen to mm -hmm. the story because yeah. you could cordially, you know, nod your head, listen, but not even take the time to process and mm -hmm. actually hear what's being said. Yeah. And sometimes what I find the most interesting is that a story that you heard in your 20s and then a story, the same, same story that you hear in your 40s has completely different profound impact. And it's amazing how God takes us through this, through our life in so many different ways. And it's really, you can't judge a book by a cover because I have tons of times had so many people say, oh, you're just a young pup. And it's like, <laughs> do we need to express the life story here? Because I can pull it out. And so, and that's one of the things is like, you don't know, you don't know people unless you take the time to get to know people. And I think it's having the compassion to take time to listen. And I think all of us have a really important story to share especially and it, and even if we don't think it's important it's important to some it makes an impact to somebody else so mm -hmm. i graciously thank you guys so much for being oh, my guest today thanks. and absolutely and i encourage all of you guys if you guys don't know these two these are an amazing couple go ahead and like and follow them on facebook um <laughs> by and you can always find us here on the capital yeah. life and you we are always broadcasting not just on Facebook, but uh, YouTube, but also our social platforms such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Anchor. And we will see you next Saturday at 530, where we will be talking about something that I'll come up with this week. I haven't decided what it is yet. But thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Abby. And yeah. I just want to remind all of you guys to remember to take care of yourself because you are somebody's everything. Have a good night. <laughs>